Good morning. Today's Bible reading is from Isaiah 7, verses 10 to 17. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. The Lord will bring on you and on all your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Thank you very much, Miranda. And good morning again. Uh, Sarah mentioned a couple of things this morning about what she loves about Christmas. I wonder what you enjoy. Uh, Christmas time coming up, it's a can be a really exciting time and really fun. For, for me, one of the things I love about Christmas is being with my family. So usually at Christmas time, uh, our little family, so Helen and I and the girls, we are together. And I really enjoy being together. And sometimes, some Christmases, like this one, we have the extra bonus of having other family around. And I'm really excited and thankful that my mum and dad will be celebrating Christmas with us. We will be together this Christmas. Uh, and there's so many things about Christmas that I enjoy. I, it's the, you know, that, the morning when people get up and you can see the excitement on their face. It's the, the food that we share. It's the little hugs through the day. It's, it's playing games together, being with one another. A and I thought, th this is a little impromptu, it's sort of based on something last night, but I really thought it was fairly important that I asked this question of all of you. Now, uh, how many of you play word games? Anyone, anyone sort of play any word games? Uh, we played games together at Christmas sometimes and there was a little bit of a dispute last night that I'm hoping you can help us settle. So I'm looking for a show of hands uh, about who actually believes that the word QI is actually really a legitimate word to use in like Scrabble or Boggle or anything like that. Did, you know, I thought so, I thought so. All right, how about those of you out there who think that LA is a legitimate word to have in, in these things? Yeah, right, okay, great. See, you like the way I phrased that question? So that all the people who didn't really want to put up their hands, they were on my side. Excellent, good. Uh, so, one of the things I enjoy about games, especially now that I have all of your authority, that la and chi or whatever that is, they're just not really words, uh, is, is games. But the most important thing is being with. Being with my family, being with people at Christmas. I just love that. And in fact, we're in a series called The Promise of Christmas. And part of the promise of Christmas is God with us, God being present with us. And so we're going to explore that a little bit this morning. And Miranda read to us uh, an excellent part of the book of Isaiah, and we're going to come back to that. But I also wanted to talk about Matthew chapter 1, verse uh, 18 through to 23. I'm going to read a little bit about the expectation of Christmas coming. So if you've got your Bible with you, or you've got your phone app, open it up to Matthew chapter 1. Verse 18, and we're just going to read a few verses here about the expectation of Jesus coming. And here's what it says. So I hope you're able to open that up. Matthew 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
Now, we've already shared this morning that as a, as a staff team, we also have been on a, a journey of expectation and looking forward. As we've journeyed with Georgia and Dave, and Georgia getting more and more pregnant, uh, and that sort of expectation that a baby is coming, a sense of anticipation, a sense of looking forward to meeting who we now know as Liara Joyce Scaife. Now, it's mixed, of course, with the inconveniences and the challenges of being pregnant, and I obviously have not been pregnant myself, but, you know, Georgia would say, oh, I'm ready for this baby to come. And yet I bet if you saw her now, what she would say is, all worth it, because now I have my beautiful baby daughter. I, I am with my daughter. That, that anticipation, that hope, it's all fulfilled just by the coming of this baby that the Scaifes now have together. And so a little bit, the promise of Christmas is the promise of a baby, the promise of a son, a child to be born. And certainly for Mary and Joseph, the promise of Christmas was the promise of this baby. That was the first promise that, and the biggest promise for them was this is a child. And in itself, having a beautiful baby was beautiful and special. But in addition, they had this kind of, but wait, there's more. In Matthew, he, he puts it, as we've just read, that this baby would be the fulfilment of prophecy. This baby would be the fulfilment of the idea that God is coming to be with us. And so, as we look forward to the birth of Jesus, and we're in this season of Advent, just thought it would be interesting to explore where did that prophecy come from? And that's why we had that reading in Isaiah. And we talked about, uh, we're talking about King Ahaz, and actually, over the last few weeks, as we've been in this series on Advent, we've been in the book of Isaiah quite a lot. And so we've, we've talked a little bit about this guy called Ahaz, who was a king of the southern um, kingdom of Judah. And it was a pretty turbulent period of international politics, where this kingdom was being pressured by the two kingdoms above it to say, you've got to be on board with us because we've got to fight the global superpower, which is called Assyria at the time. And uh, there was war even between these countries, as they said, you have to join us, otherwise we can't fight Assyria. And Ahaz, it wasn't a particularly great king, and he was struggling. And, and so Isaiah comes and presents God's word to Ahaz. And Isaiah says, look, this is what the Lord says. The Lord says, ask me for a sign, Ahaz. Ask me what's going on. And Isaiah had been telling him, you need to just trust that God is with us. You don't need to make alliances with all these other nations. You need to trust in God, that God is with us. And so eventually it gets to the point where God even says to Ahaz, ask me for a sign, I'll show you that I'm with you. But Ahaz is not in that space. He's not trusting in God. And so Isaiah comes to him and says, King Ahaz, you're really frustrating. Is it not enough that you'll try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of God also? I tell you what, Ahaz, God's going to give you a sign anyway, because God is with you. And so wherever you're at, Ahaz, here's what the sign is going to be. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He'll be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. So what Isaiah says to Ahaz is this. You might be a frustrating and poor king, but God is with us. And he is going to show us because a son is going to be born. A son called God with us. And in your lifetime as Ahaz, God is going to sort out this international political mess. And as we read further in the Bible, we see that indeed, uh, even though the two kingdoms that were warring with Judah got carried off into exile and destroyed, the kingdom of Judah, whilst Ahaz was alive, was left untouched. God with us. And so that sign, that prophecy that came true for Ahaz was part of what Matthew referred back to. He said, that's what happened in those days, but that prophecy wasn't just for Ahaz, that was actually for us as well. This prophecy that a child would be born to a virgin, and that would be God with us. And in the experience of those who then met that child who grew up, Jesus, that was exactly what Jesus was. If you're familiar with any of the stories of Jesus, he was with the people. 
He turns up at parties and turns water into wine. He's, he's with people hanging out. He's at weddings and funerals and banquets. He's walking through huge crowds and yet still is with the people who he knows need him. He is with people all the time as we see his walk and his journey on earth. And so this promise of God with us turned out to be absolutely true. That was and is Jesus. And so that's the promise of Christmas. And my next question is, well, what about us? Well, Jesus doesn't walk the earth in physical form now. So how is God with us relevant for us today? And so I wanted to explore that briefly together. The promise of Christmas is God with us. What does that mean for you and me today? And I want to suggest there's three things. There's a whole lot more, but I'm just going to suggest three things. And the first one is this, that God with us offers us comfort. God with us offers us comfort. I wonder if you've experienced a moment in your life where uh, things were tough and someone just came alongside you just to be with you. I've got a couple of examples out of my life. One is just in my marriage. So sometimes, uh, you know, I've had a hard day, I get home, I can't even explain what's going on, it's just, it's too hard, and I'm just struggling. And my wife will notice that, and sometimes she will just be with me. Sometimes she's with me with a bowl of ice cream, which is the best type of being with, but she will just be with. She won't try and solve anything. She won't probe and press. She's just there. Another example I've got is um, funerals. Now, I know it's been a difficult season for many, many of you, many of our families uh, over the last few years have attended a funeral or more. And I've been to quite a number of funerals and uh, some of them for people that I knew well some of them for people that I didn't know so well, but there's a consistent thing that I observe at funerals, and that is that in the mourning and the grieving, there's not always a lot said by the people who are gathered, and yet there's something special about just being with. There's a knowledge that we sit there together, celebrating, remembering, mourning, grieving, we're just with together, and I think that's actually part of the reason that we do funerals, to be with one another. And so as I think about Jesus, he, he came in human form to be with those who need comfort. And he said in his uh, Sermon on the Mount, those who mourn will be comforted. So how does he do that for us today? Well, he has sent us his Holy Spirit. And in Acts 9.31, it says this, that the churches through all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord, they were comforted in the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. So there's an explicit verse that says the Holy Spirit is the comforter for us. And so today, the promise of God with us, one part of that is the offer of comfort to us through the Holy Spirit who is with us. The second thing I want to suggest that God with us offers, uh, God with us offers us today is hope. Hope for everything that we're engaged in. And I want to show you that because there are, there are three levels, I guess, of hope in what we've already covered as we've read through these two passages this morning. The first one is the obvious hope that Mary and Joseph had of new life. Just the simple fact of the arrival of their child. There's hope. Just for them personally, people have children all over the planet every day. And it brings deep, personal, intimate hope. So the arrival of this baby boy brought hope to them. But also it was more than that. We see God offering hope to a nation. Uh, from the example of Ahaz, where the whole conversation was about Ahaz, there is hope for your nation because God is with us in the midst of the international political turmoil. And the third thing, of course, is hope for all humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Hope for all of humanity. And in that passage in Matthew, it explicitly said, call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. There's this sense of saving of all people. And so there's hope for us on a deep, intimate, personal level. There's hope on a sort of a national, geopolitical level. In fact, there is hope for all of humanity in all of time because of God with us. And the third thing I'd suggest God with us offers is purpose. Brings purpose. 
Now, some years ago, uh, my family, Helen, Helen and I and the girls, we travelled to India. Uh, and I've, I've told this story before. Uh, I'm not sure whether you've heard it. But, but we actually went because we realised, being part of Carey, it'd be really interesting to see what William Carey did, or at least where he did it. And so we travelled to India, to Kolkata, which used to be Calcutta, and we travelled north upriver, about 25 kilometres, to a place called Serampore, and that's where William Carey had been a missionary for many years. He built a college there, uh, and it was just an amazing trip. Uh, but the point about it is actually that when we were staying in Kolkata, we stayed 400 metres, literally 400 metres, down exactly the same road that Mother Teresa House was located on. And so we thought, wow, this is a bit of a bonus. We've come to see William Carey, but actually we're going to go and see this place where Mother Teresa ministered. Now, who was Mother Teresa? Uh, you may also know her story. At the age of 19, she moved to India, at first to a convent called Loretto, a convent that was further north than the city of Calcutta. And she was there for a number of years. Uh, but then her heart was just really moved, and she's dedicated about 50 years of her life to the people in the slums of Calcutta. Uh, one of the amazing things that she did, and I think we've got a picture there to show you uh, of this place, and that I think is Mother Teresa. She opened this place called the Caligat Home for the Dying. A and one of the parts or one of the points of this place was that she had observed walking around Calcutta that frequently people would just die on the corner of the street alone. And she made this house and she created a, a mission or a, a ministry. They were called the um, Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. And what they would do in this house is people could come there, they would be on death's door, but they would have someone to be with them as they died. And the role of the sisters was just to be with. And in that process of being with, bring the comfort and the hope that is Jesus Christ. Let me read to you uh, briefly a, a little, uh, well, it's a sort of a thought bubble. It's out of a biography of Mother Teresa by a lady called Catherine Spink. And so this is Teresa talking and she says, the power of the poor, sorry, the poverty of the poor must be so hard for them. While looking for a home, so she's looking for somebody in where they lived, I walked and walked till my arms and legs ached. And I thought how much they must ache in body and soul looking for a home and food and health. Then the comfort of Loretto came to tempt me. Now bear in mind, convents are pretty Spartan. So she's being tempted by the comfort of a fairly Spartan convent. The, the comfort of Loretto came to tempt me. You have only to say the word and all that will be yours again, the tempter kept on saying. But of free choice, my God, and out of love for you, I desire to remain and do whatever your holy will has in store for me. And I did not let a single tear come. Just this incredible monologue or inner, inner dialogue of this lady whose purpose was to be with those who needed her. And why? Because that's what she saw her saviour do. Her purpose in life came from seeing that Jesus' purpose was to come from heaven to earth to be with And so that's what Mother Teresa did. She followed Jesus, offering comfort, offering hope, modelling herself on him. And so as I was processing that story, I thought, gee, I wonder what it would mean for us as we think about this idea of purpose. This week, this Christmas, is there somebody that you will come across who is perhaps grieving? Somebody that you will come across or that you know who is lonely? Somebody on Christmas Day, wherever you are, that's maybe just sitting by themselves, that you can just be with. It's kind of a simple call, isn't it? To offer comfort and hope just by being with. So I wonder if there's a purpose for some of us this Christmas in that. This promise of Christmas is that God came and God is with us. And in that, he brings us comfort and hope and purpose. And that's for us today. It's a promise for you, for me, for all of humanity. And so as we lead into Christmas, I, I hope you have a fabulous Christmas time. Whether you're still working and racing to get there, uh, whether you're already on holidays and feeling a bit relaxed. I trust, I pray that this Christmas you will know God with you. 
uh, that it will be a time of being with others. And so I pray that you experience God's joy this week in that knowledge. Let's pray together as we close this message and look forward to the arrival of Jesus. We're celebrating that in a week's time. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you that you're with us. Thank you so much. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to be with us, to be with humanity, each one of us in a deep, intimate and personal way. And we thank you that you continue to do that through your Holy Spirit and that you bring comfort and hope to our situations as we need. As we look forward to Christmas time and all that we might enjoy in it, we pray that you would also help us to reflect on who you are calling us to be with the purpose of calling us for others. So please show us that and allow us to make the decision just to be with those that you call us to be. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.